I came back from my 10th visit to Burma a couple of months ago, so I'd like to talk about some of my impressions, but also, to begin with, um, to give a sort of perspective on where I think uh, Burma and the subject of my book, Aung San Suu Kyi, are going um, in the um, process of these coming two or three years, which are absolutely crucial for Burma's future. The first time I met Aung San Suu Kyi was in 2002, uh, when she had been uh, just released from house arrest. And I was the independence correspondent in Delhi and jumped on a plane, got a tourist visa and went into to, uh, Rangoon and interviewed her there. And at that time, I think it's fair to say that she was f famous, but at the same time, almost completely unknown. She'd become famous in the course of a few months in 1989, uh, when she basically created the National League for Democracy. Then she disappeared into house arrest in July of that year, and was really only glimpsed over a few months in the subsequent years. Since then, and in particular since her last, and uh, one hopes and also believes, final release from house arrest in 2010, she's come much more clearly into focus. And I think it's also fair to say that she's lost a lot of popularity in the West. For a long time um, until then in the West, she was um, seen as a, a sort of saintly figure um, who sort of epitomized uh, sort of saintly virtues, um, and who was willing to sacrifice the comforts of a conventional English life and, and uh, her marriage and everything else, um, and all she got in return was years and years of house arrest. Since she came out of house arrest, um, it's, she's, gone from, she's evolved from being a, an icon to being a person who is determined to do everything in her power to transform the destiny of her country. Um, in other words, she's become a politician who doesn't yet have any power. Uh, and, and in that process, uh, she has lost a lot of the esteem of her supporters in the West because she is doing the sort of things that politicians do, um, making decisions which um, are practical ones. When uh, Suu Kyi, uh, suddenly emerged on the stage in Burma in August 1988, there had been no democratic um, functioning, really functioning democratic culture in, in the country since 1962. And she practically single-handedly carved a dem democratic space out of that tyrannical culture, um, terrifying the, the military who have basically been in a funk about her, her power and her potential ever since. And you can see that ever since her emergence, they have been attempting to neutralize, to contain, um, uh, and if possible, to, to eliminate her physically. The most recent attempt to, to contain her and to neutralize her extraordinary popularity is um, a declaration by the election commissioner that before the general election scheduled for next year, which will probably happen in um, November, um, candidates for parliament can only campaign within their own constituency, which is targeted clearly at the fact that, as in 1989 and as in 2012, when she led a very successful campaign for by-elections, she is a a uh, formidable campaigner on the stump. I mean, she has an incredible appeal. The critics of Aung San Suu Kyi, both uh, within Burma and in, in other countries, would say that uh, she is to blame for the fact that Burma remains today the poorest country in Southeast Asia, um, very much underdeveloped compared to um, practically all of its regional neighbors. Uh, and she's to blame for that because she uh, supported sanctions. And given her global status and um, her Nobel Prize and so on, her prestige, 
the fact that she was opposed to sanctions being lifted until there was democratic change basically inhibited the West from investing. It, it inhibited a lot of people, particularly in this country, from going as tourists, but it also stopped, uh, arguably, it stopped the country from jumping on the, the escalator of, of development. Um, the answer to that uh, is that now you've got development beginning, and the only reason it is actually working is because it coincided with democratic reform. The reform was brought about um, by the ex-general Thane Sein, who is the president, and who, against everyone's expectations, began a quite um, dramatic process of reform soon after he became president in 2011. There's something like 11 daily papers in, in, in Burma now. Um, there is a, great, a much greater sense of freedom. And um, although you know, there, are, there are problems with people being arrested in demonstrations and so on, but much, it, the, the climate of fear has really disappeared. But what's become apparent after two years of reform is that beneath that... Um, that changed landscape, the, the fundamental realities of power within the country have not changed at all. Um, the power has been with the military ever since General Ne Win staged his coup d'etat in 1962. The military have, formally speaking, symbolically withdrawn from politics, but the ruling party is dominated by former military men. Um, and the economic power is in the hands of retired generals and the friends of the retired generals and the friends of existing generals. Now, we had by-elections in, in 2012 when Suu Kyi became an MP, which, like the election of 1990, were run with remarkable fairness, um, and international observers were very happy about the way they were run, and the National League for Democracy won 43 of the 44 seats they contested. So um, the, 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 the probability is that the, election, the general elections next year will be run like the by-elections of 2012, um, because at this point, too much, uh, there is too much uh, of Burma's prestige depends on them uh, carrying out this election in a fair way. So I think one can expect it to be, to be carried out fairly. But... Will the NLD win? I'd assumed because they did so well in 1990 and 2012 that they would win easily, but there's a constitutional lawyer I met in, in Rangoon in February who said, no, that's not the case. The uh, USDP will win a large number of seats, partly through intimidation, because they have a lot of money for bribery, um, because they will win in the ethnic areas where the people feel vulnerable. Ethnic parties will win dozens of seats, if the NLD were to win 40%, um, that would be a pretty good result. So we're not looking forward to a landslide victory. We're possibly looking forward to, uh, at the best, a coalition between the NLD and some of the ethnic parties. Obviously, writing your biography of Suu Kyi, you became very absorbed with her. Um, and you wrote about her very principled approach to, to everything in her life, including umpiring her children's games. And, and you know, she never... A principle was very important to her. Um, as you say, she's been criticised a lot recently. I mean, obviously, she could never have maintained her saintly uh, reputation as, as a working politician but she's been criticised for cozying up to the military and for, for her apparent silence or at least reluctance to speak about the persecution of, of minorities, of the Muslim minority. Um, d d does this... Has, is she is, is this political expediency? Is she compromising her principles? And... Are you surprised or at all disappointed by that? Well, I think that, I think that um, 
lots of people, including me in the, in the West, are uh, disappointed in the sense that one would love to hear her say uh, the obvious truth about the persecution of the Rohingya um, and of other Muslim communities. The, um, it's difficult to say this without sort of sounding like one's justifying, but her, her, one of her Achilles heel in Burma is her marriage to Michael Harris and her long residence outside Burma. Um, and given, as I mentioned in what I was saying earlier, her, this, this sort of seam of xenophobia in the country, it, it is quite easily turned into a, a, an attack on her. There was a coincidence between her coming into Parliament, winning the election in April 2012, and starting to travel for the first time, to travel abroad, um, and the first uh, attacks on Muslims in Arakan State, um, which people were expecting her to denounce, and, and she, she maintained this rather sort of creepy silence, which she's kept ever since. Um, and I think that the, um, the, the reason is that, well, the two reasons. One is that she knows uh, that the majority of the Burmese Buddhists are uh, paranoid about Islam, um, that paranoia having been sort of stoked over the years by Buddhist teachers, and also that she is vulnerable to these, these um, slanders that she's not really Burmese at all. She's identifiable with these other aliens who actually threaten the state. Um, so I think one can, without being happy about that silence, I think one can understand it quite well, given that her goal has always been very clear. Her goal right from the outset was been, you know, I could actually, it's in my power, possibly, to transform this country. So there's absolutely no point in taking a step which would scupper that. Um, Burma, I think, always has held a kind of exotic uh, reputation in the West uh, as a very charming place and, and a place that, that still retains this feeling of a of bygone Asia. When you've returned over recent years um, since the sort of economic reforms and apparently you know, there's more um, in international investment um, and development, particularly in, in Rangoon, have you seen a certain homogenization of, of the city? And do, do you feel that Burma can uh, retain a kind of distinctive charm? Certainly it's retained it so far, but that's, in, again, partly due to the fact that a lot of the changes are sort of in, in the forms of promise rather than actuality. The worst thing that's happened from that point of view in Rangoon so far is an explosion of the number of cars on the road. <laughs> Um, so it's, be it's, it's become much more like um, another Asian city in that it takes ages to get anywhere. Um, there is, uh, there's been a growth in the sense um, that Rangoon is a, an extremely beautiful city, uh, and a lot of the beauty is connected to its colonial past and the buildings that remain in greater numbers in Rangoon than in any other Asian city. And there is a movement, uh, there's a, 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 an organization set up to try to preserve that heritage. Um, a lot of Burmese would say, well, this isn't our heritage, this is British imposition. Why do we, why do we need it? Let's tear it down and build something of our own. But there are counter voices pointing out that the scale is, is decent and, and, and human. Um, that the, the, the city has a, a unique character. Um, it has an incredible amount of greenery, an uh, incredible amount of water. Um, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's also a bewitching city. And if it were to, uh, to go the way of Bangkok, which is conceivable, it would be a great pity. Um, and one hopes, you know, that the countries that enter the development game late in the day will actually have the opportunity to look around and say, well, actually, we don't want to go that way. There must be another way. And there'll be enough voices and experts and uh, people from outside encouraging them to take a different course.